Hey, welcome everybody to Inspirational Focus. And it is springtime, and springtime brings us Easter. So today's conversation is going to be about Easter and some of the traditions and different things behind that. And with me today is Jeremy Hollingshead, who is a, a Lutheran pastor. Yes, sir. Thanks for being here. Uh, so can we say with more certainty mm -hmm. that Easter is correct in its date or at least time of year than, say, like uh, Christmas? Because we, we had that conversation, I think, at Christmas time. Is that really the time? And we really can't say. Right. A lot of people will have theories on Christmas when it really happened. And people are like, well, you know, sources say it's most likely in this month. And I'm like, we have no idea. There's no way to know that. I mm -hmm. mean, those are educated guesses, and they're still guesses, because mm -hmm. we can have no certainty as to when Christ was actually born. You know, Christ could have been born on December 25th. Um, he also could have been born 364 other days of the year. Mm -hmm. It would be really funny if he was born on leap year, though, because then Christmas would only come once every four years. Oh, drat. <laughs> 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 be a big present blowout then, though. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, and it's not like the calendar was the exact one that we have now, anyway. Right. Right. So because the, they had a Jewish calendar then. Well, there's yeah, and it, and it was based on lunar cycles. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a Easter as a holiday um, is set every year, and um, a lot of times it's in line with um, the Jewish feast of Passover. And so, again, it's, it's based on lunar cycles and things like that. That's why it's not always the same weekend every year. Um, we know, well, we don't know necessarily, you know, if people um, want to dispute um, accuracy of things in Scripture, so we don't know it. But, like, we believe, um, if we read Scripture, that Jesus does die during the festival of the Passover, right? So... Um, they have the, the, the Paschal Feast in um, uh, Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, and Luke's Gospel. Um, but the, in John's Gospel, Jesus is basically set up as a metaphor for the Paschal Lamb. Like he's the Passover sacrifice. Mm -hmm. so, um, is that why supposedly it happens at this time of year? Well, in Scripture, as you read Scripture, um, on the night... Um, so Jesus gets betrayed by Judas, right? And the authorities come to get him, and they take him away. They had just celebrated the Passover, right? They just had, um, that, that was the meal that they had. When we talk that about was the Last the, Supper, right? right? That so, was Passover. Yeah, and so that's, that's in a way how um, Christianity, one of the ways that Christianity is kind of linked to Judaism, in that um, Christ's last meal with his... Um, apostles or disciples, um, the twelve, uh, was that Passover meal, right? And so, you know, he's got the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the wine and all these kinds of things that we will celebrate in the Christian church, mm -hmm. and some of them every Sunday. Right. Um, you know, this, that, that moment, that event, um, is, is when Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples. You know, he sends a couple of the guys ahead of him into town, and he's supposed to be finding a guy that's carrying water. You know, culturally, that's really weird. Men didn't carry water. Right, right. And so um, when they see this guy, you're like, why would it be, you know, you, you read it, and you're like, how are they going to just find this one random dude carrying water? Because it's probably the only guy in the whole town carrying water, that's why. And so that's going to be a noticeable feature about the guy. So Jesus tells them to find this guy carrying water, and that he's going to prepare for them a room in which for them to celebrate the Passover. Okay. And so then you have that Lord's Supper. And so um, initially it's tied to the Passover in John's Gospel, which is written closer to about 100 A.D., or, you know, or C.E., I guess is the right term now. So it's written about 100 C.E., um, maybe 99. Uh, what's going to happen then is the metaphor is going to be even stronger, not just that they're celebrating the Passover, but that Christ himself is that Paschal Lamb mm -hmm. through the, the language and the dialogue. That's kind of made apparent. And along with the, the Christian, or not Christian, the Christmas date and mm -hmm. stuff, there's also the things behind Easter. Why was Christmas celebrated then? Because the Christians 
in order to spread or eat more easily spread the religion they mm -hmm. took over some of the previous religions celebrations right so there's in in any change like in the history of humanity there's almost always a little bit of religious syncretism like blending of faiths one of the reasons that's done is just it's pragmatic it's hard to get people to convert and give up everything they did and had before mm -hmm. it's hard to get people to change everything the other idea is that um, if you can get them to celebrate with you because they're used to celebrating, maybe you can slowly draw them in to be part of your numbers and these kind of things. Not that it's deceitful or a trick, it's just, you know, this is what we do, this no, is what we do Solstice is it. a good time to do it's so. not. It's not super different than when you do it, you know, these, these kind of things. So uh, we have um, this, this movement through history. So long before there was a celebration of Easter, as in the risen Christ, there was a celebration of Easter with E-O-S-T-R-E. Mm -hmm. And so she was the fertility goddess of spring. And so there's a pagan festival during the exact same time. Who, who were year. the pagans that celebrated that? Was it Romans or was it uh, pagans like we would find in England? It would have been like Gaelic or Celtic. So you're, you're, you're a big deal in England. Okay. Right, um, and maybe even in Germanic tribes. So mm -hmm. it's it's that um, European um, uh, paganism that the yeah, spring the spring about. planting mm -hmm. yeah. and fertile yeah. stuff, big time. <laughs> and so um, one thing, it was a fertility festival, and you know, for a, a good spring and a good harvest and all these things, hoping for a harvest to come that was good and. So people would make their offerings to to Easter, like Goddess of the Dawn. Because survival things. back then was a little harder yeah. than it is now. And so they would eat rabbits. Rabbits are very fertile. They produce lots of kids. It's easy to get a whole lot of rabbits in a hurry, right? So it's a good um, luck to eat a rabbit, I guess. It was for them. Okay. Yeah, and it was also a way to celebrate that fertility. Eggs, right? I mean, that's an unborn chicken. Mm -hmm. So you had eggs, you had bunnies, all these fertile things, and you would eat those during this time in honor of Easter and hope to have, you know, enough spring rain and a bountiful harvest. And so Easter was celebrated a long time. The, the name Easter actually doesn't have anything to do with Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, um, is there a Christian word for Easter that we should reuse more? No, I mean, uh, <laughs> That's like, just what it there's is. just nothing there. Okay, I wasn't sure. Right? If... And we, we spell it differently, of course, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, for us it's E A S T E R, but um, I have never seen anything about why it's called that other than it's actually the festival for that pagan deity. Just just like our our days of the week are mm -hmm. based in Viking. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna change you're gonna change Wednesday to something else. Right. Or Thursday Thursday was Thursday. Wednesday was Odin's day. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of things named after. Uh, mythological or pagan figures, however you want to say that. I don't want to say mythological because that's disrespectful to people who are still practitioners of that faith. Sure, right. Not that there's a lot of folks worshiping Odin these days, but there, there there's are more. People, there it are seems people like. that, that, that that claim like druidic beliefs or, or paganism as, mm -hmm. as their religion, and I I'm, I want to be very respectful of that and understand that that is a legitimate belief that a lot of people have, and so I'm not talking smack on them. Right. But I, I am saying that, you know. Um, if people were in an uproar or mad because I said that the name is derivative from, you know, a pagan deity. Um, Sorry, it just <clears> is. It's just historically <laughs> accurate, right? Um, and I, I'm not disrespecting that deity or, or the belief in her or any of those things. Sure. But, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying Christmas. Well, like I said about uh, Christmas. Yeah. It was a way to spread it. It really was. And, and, and it was pragmatic and it made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and... I'm not trying to say that what we did initially was wrong or any of these kind of things. It's just, it's what happened. Right. And, you know, you decide for yourself whether you want to have, like, your kids find Easter eggs. I mean. <laughs> churches probably have people. People, churches, like, <laughs> almost every church in my city has an Easter egg hunt on Easter, right? Well, what, do you, what else are you going to do for, for children? Well, you know? you know, you can always talk about the risen Christ, which is what yeah. we're actually supposed to be celebrating. That's Christians. not exciting, and I don't get anything yeah. out of that. Yeah, well, except for maybe salvation. Right, and, <laughs> well, and you have your, your Easter basket from the Easter Bunny fertility, right? Mm -hmm. 
So you got, you know, everything we do for children during Easter, other than, you know, if we do talk about the risen Christ, mm -hmm. um, really has a lot more to do with celebration of a pagan deity than it does um, actually celebrating Christ. Jesus has nothing to do with your kid's Easter basket. I mean, yeah. now, you can say that, you know, God makes us stewards of all that we have, and it's actually God's, not ours. And so we, we choose to do, you know, various things with that money. And so really that Easter basket does come from God. Yeah, okay. I can go down that long and winding road and say that's accurate. <clears throat> but the idea that, like, we're honoring God with an Easter basket, no. It's a little weird. Yeah, and that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's, but that's why we got bunnies and eggs at Easter. Right. And that's, that's, you know, it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with Jesus. Uh, isn't there a flower that... No, we have crocuses and Easter lilies, and those just... This Easter lily is the white one, right, that mm -hmm. comes up this... Mm -hmm. Is that just the time of the year thing? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's the time of year, and it's, it's, it's nearly always right around Easter that those actually bloom for the first time. Mm -hmm. you know, my daffodils are already out, though, so I mean, you know, I, I've got crocuses and Easter lilies, and it's not even close to Easter because Easter's so late this year. Right. Yeah. Is there a thing uh, like dogwoods? Okay, so... There's a legend. Because there's a connection between Easter and dogwoods, right? Well, I don't know if there's a connection between Easter and dogwoods as much as there's uh, supposedly a connection between the crucifixion and dogwoods. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. The crucifixion so, and Easter. Yeah. Is so Easter is the day of the risen Christ. There are five church holidays in eight days during that week. You know, so that's why it's Holy Week. Right. So um, the thing with the crucifixion and the dogwood trees is, according to legend, um, a dogwood tree is what Christ was crucified on, and that's why they don't grow right, and they're all twisted, and... God cursed them. Yeah, and, you know, you got to prune them really good and whatever else to make them get big because they're just, they're twisted up and they won't grow right. Mm -hmm. um, and they've got the four leaves in their, their blooms with white and red. Yeah. So... They like red blood of folks, Christ. Folks make up all kinds of different things <coughs> over the years. St. Patrick taught used um, shamrocks, clovers uh, to to teach the Trinity, mm -hmm. three and one, right? Um, that may not be a great way to, to teach the Trinity, but it worked for him in Ireland in that time, right? So there's a lot of contextual things, and people we like our legends, we like our stories, mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the things that a lot of people think um, it's not that they're bad or that they're wrong. Uh, it just all depends on what is your major source for all these kind of things and why you believe them. So, as a Lutheran pastor, where where did the dogwood thing come from? Well, I have it no idea. In the, man. It's not in the Bible, right? No, and that's what I was going to say. So, as a Lutheran pastor, we've got these things called the solas, and they mean like grace alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone. You know, those those kind of deals. I don't know if Marty knew what alone meant, because if they're alone, then why are there five of them? But hmm. anyway, I digress. So, so one of them is Scripture alone, right? And so nowhere in Scripture do I see anything that says Christ was crucified on a dogwood tree. Therefore, the likelihood of that is about as likely as Christ being born on Christmas. I'm not sure how many dogwood you know, is that, trees... Is that because somebody... I don't know if dogwoods are from there. I don't even know. Or if you just find them in Appalachia and so somebody saw the, the, the four leaves white with a little red on it and they bloom about this time of year and so then they just made up the story. Sure. To, to be cool or what? You know, it's just like this, you know, I, I don't know if they made it up to be cool. Maybe they even believed it when they saw it. Mm -hmm. Maybe they saw this message of Christ in this tree and then, and so spreading, it's like the telephone game, it becomes bigger. And then people, you know, it ends up being what it is. So if you know what that <laughs> is, and, you know, you're watching this on YouTube, uh, put it in the comments if you know where the, uh, the dogwood uh, story come from. Right. And, but, I, you know, I, I would not guess necessarily that it's very true. Um, it could be. It's a nice story. But I, I, I doubt <laughs> it. You know, it, it's, it's, it's one of these things where we make up a lot of stuff and tie it to our major beliefs. And justify it. See, there's proof. See, there's proof. And um, that may be good in the moment, but um, when the rest of history is left trying to deal with these comments, it makes it a little tougher because you got no way to prove any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and well, faith's not about proof; it's about believing. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. And at the same time... There has to be a little fact behind it. Well, yeah. Um, and the, the other thing that I find interesting about Easter is this should be our day, right? As, as Christians, this should be our day. This, right. should, this be should be number one holiday. Absolutely. Like, like I said at Christmas, why is Christmas a big deal? That's when he was born. But the, the huge miracle, mm -hmm. which there was two miracles, but the huge miracle was rising from the dead. Sure. Anybody can be born, mm -hmm. but who comes back? Right. Right. And so for us, this should be the day because we have... We often preach um, Christ crucified in churches, which is important, mm -hmm. um, especially when you talk about theories of atonement and all these different kinds of things. Um, but Christ rising from the dead is what offers validity to every other Christian thing, right? So if Jesus stays dead, right, if Jesus doesn't rise again, then the person that was crucified can't really save us. Because the person that's crucified isn't special. Mm -hmm. Just like every other Joe that hung on a cross. If the person who was crucified doesn't raise from the dead, it doesn't really matter that he was born in the first place. Right? And, but it does matter that he was born in the first place because as Christians we believe he's risen from the dead. Right. It does matter that he was crucified because through that crucifixion we were saved because we know that he's God because he was raised from the dead. Right. So it's this resurrection that lends power to every other belief that we have, lends strength, lends fortitude. Now, you know, this belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is a lot more easy to believe when he raises from the dead. Who raised him from the dead? Did God say, wake up? Or did he go, I'm coming back? Well, <laughs> That's, I'm not uh, exactly... Maybe a question that never yeah, <laughs> asked. I, I, I'm not exactly certain. The, the, the idea could be that, um, you know, he just, he returned. Um... God could have sent him back. The uh, Holy Spirit could have brought him back, you know, with the breath of life. Or, or um, and there was, I've heard people say, well, what if he was just in a near-death experience and didn't quite, but he looked dead? You know, those people back then may not have been able to tell if he was near coma. I don't and think so. I feel better now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not dead yet. No. Um, the, the the problem. I'm not is, making light of the whole thing. No, I'm but, not you know. either. But. The problem is that crucifixion is extremely brutal. Mm -hmm. and, and the beating he took before that, and so, the being stabbed in the side. Yeah. So Jesus likely, um, he's exerting himself, carrying the cross all the way, because he'd already been beaten so bad and he was short of blood. Right. Right? Um, he probably needed a transfusion or two. You know, he's probably pretty low on blood. Can't carry the cross, so you have Simon of Cyrene, have to carry it the rest of the way for him. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, they get there, they hang him. Um, they go to break the legs of everyone that's crucified. They break the legs of the thieves. Jesus is already dead. Hmm. Now. That's so they, they can't hold themselves up any longer, right? right? So the way crucifixion works is um, you suffocate to death. The weight of your body crushes your chest mm -hmm. so that you're no longer strong enough to take a breath. And you have to lift yourself up so that you can breathe. So if somebody has passed out. We don't want to wait around all day well, or two, three days for these people to die. So well, they can't. They hurry it up, right? Well, yeah, they're going to break their legs so that they die sooner. Right. And so they go to break Jesus' legs. <clears throat> He's already dead. Mm -hmm. He's not breathing. Now, well, didn't the dudes, the, the, the they soldier... They did the spear, yeah. To do the same thing? Yeah, they, they bleed he, him he so felt they'll bleed bad. out faster. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's because he felt bad. I don't think it says that in Scripture, but we can, we can infer that. Sure. You know, it's like, um, well, this guy suffered really bad. Here, take this. It might have just been common practice. They die sooner. Yeah. Otherwise, crucifixion could last like six days. Yeah. And the Jews wanted them down. Right? Like, so, so the people wanted them down because it was festival of Passover. You know, next day's the Sabbath. Right? We've got to have this drama over with so we can get on with life, pretty much. But yeah. The, um, the next day's the Sabbath. So they've got to get him off there and buried before sundown. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a big deal. Right. Because they can't touch anything unclean on the Sabbath. You don't want to be ceremonially unclean on the Sabbath. So, okay. Um, they got to get them down, buried, and get themselves prepared before the sun goes down on Friday. So because of that, you know, they're going to go and they're going to break. Not the Romans are going to break his legs, right? Um, but he's already dead. Now, the idea that he was just near death 
and hadn't really died yet. There's a lot that goes against that. Number one, he was as likely to die from exsanguination as he was from um, suffocation because of the beating that he took mm -hmm. and the amount of blood that he lost. Right. Right. Number two, um, if you're just passed out or just near death and you're being crucified, you're going to die. Just because you're hanging there, you can't take a breath. You can't lift yourself up to take a breath. If you can't breathe, you die. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's not like it wasn't. A, it's not like it was a really short process in getting them down. So that theory is pretty much. I think it's pretty bad. Okay. You know, you're, you're a lot better off saying his disciples moved the stone, rigged it, found his body, and buried it somewhere else so they could all lie to us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot more believable than he was just near death. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't think that's what happened. Don't hear me that saying that sure. that's what happened. Um, you know, but th that is a far more likely story than Jesus wasn't actually dead. Do he was dead, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, I, th I think that's that's pretty legitimate. Uh, but the fact that he rose again is is why I don't know if everything that was, else matters. I don't know if that was something that came out of that movie that William Defoe was in. Oh, the Last Temptation of Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With, you know, because he lived afterwards, right? In that he came down from the cross, so he, the crucifixion didn't kill him. Right. So, um, well, he has this dream that the crucifixion doesn't kill him, and then at the end he realizes it was just a dream, and then he actually does die, and like he kind of like is smiling when he dies. I think mm. isn't that how it ends? I, I don't it's remember. been years since I've yeah. seen it. So, um, and a lot of Christians really disliked that movie, mm -hmm. and and. Um, Maybe it's because of the time period and, and whatever else, but um, I kind of, I think I kind of like it, but um, people are like, well, he's God, he couldn't be tempted. And I'm like, yeah, but he's also human. He was put here to be human and yeah. to be tempted and everything else. And then that was the other thing, too. So you have this episode of Jesus being tempted in the desert for 40 days, and that's okay. Um, Jesus continually pray, prays in the garden for the cup to be able to pass from him. But, in, you know, he doesn't shirk his duty, mm -hmm. right? He, he loves us too much to, to not um, save us. And he also loves us too much to stay dead, right? That was that's another why he rises. That was another thing that we, we talked about earlier was, uh, was he sent by God to die? Or did he give it willingly? Okay, so it could be both easily. And a lot of that's going to depend on... You know, what you read in Scripture and what you believe is um, the way that Jesus saves the world. We talk about the atonement, mm -hmm. right? Like Christ's right. atonement for the sin of humanity. So there are lots of ways that people believe about atonement. Um, the most popular in America, I believe, is like penal substitutionary atonement. And so it's this idea that um, Christ cannot, or not Christ, but God cannot have a relationship with humanity anymore because of the fall. Like in the garden, right? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, um, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so from that point on, we're cast down, and we have like a spontaneous urge to do what is wrong. So, um, and then God <clears throat> needs to be reconciled to us, but sees all our sin. And so Christ dies, takes on all of our sins, because he's blameless, he can do this. And then God sees us through Christ's sacrifice, and we are reconciled to him. And um, now we can be back in full relationship with God, as mm -hmm. opposed to not being in full relationship and having the law and all these other different kinds of things. Um, and so that's, that's, that's penal substitutionary atonement, where Christ takes on all of our sins, and God sees us through Christ and his righteousness rather than our own sinfulness. Um, but God demanded punishment, and God demanded a sacrifice, and Christ was that perfect sacrifice to set us all free. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, or the elect free, depending on how you be how you believe. But um, there are others too, like Luther's happy exchange, where Christ gladly exchanges his righteousness for uh, our sinfulness, and then God views us through that righteousness of Christ. I'm going to do this for you. Yeah, and so on that one, it's a lot less about punishment and punishment being necessary, and more about um, Jesus being this unifying force that brings us back into full communion with God. And selfless giving. And selfless giving. And selfless giving is also part of another atonement theory, in whereas um, 
humanity sees the suffering of Christ, sees what it means to actually love, knows that um, in being more like Christ or um, in better relationship with God, that we put others above ourselves. And now we are not necessarily destined, but called and have seen what it looks like to really love. And so then we will be encouraged and empowered to be more like Christ, to continue to put others first, and that is a way that the world will be saved. Yeah. And so no atonement theory is necessarily complete in and of itself, although people will argue that point and say that all you really need is penal substitutionary, and it's a lot of people's favorite in this country because it's the only one they know. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I've, I've heard from some people that, you know, Jesus didn't come here in order to be worshipped. He came here, I mean, I didn't come here to be God and, okay, worship me. It was more that that I came here to show you how to be. Well, and that would definitely go along with that Christ is moral exemplar. Right. Um, And that could be someone's primary atonement theory. People Mm -hmm. believe that way. Um, And I'm not trying to say, there are seven, eight, nine really good theories of atonement. Mm -hmm. I don't think any theory is complete in and of itself because really Christ might use all of these in some ways to, to save the world. Um, you can have one or two that you like better. I think a lot of a lot of pastors that have studied atonement theory usually settle on two that they like the best, that does the best explanation and complements each other, and that's that's really what they believe about the atonement. Some of them have more than that. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a buddy that really liked um, Jean Girard, so he had like Girardian and Moral Exemplar as his. My, mine is probably Christ, the victorious Christ, you know, who wins defeats death, defeats the grave, defeats mm-hmm. sin, and um, empowers us to do likewise through his moral example. So it's, it's, for me, it's the victorious Christ, mm-hmm. and Christ is moral exemplar. You know, penal substitutionary atonement is a thing that, that works for a lot of folks, but um, I don't find it really uplifting. And I'm not saying it's not a thing, but I, I don't right. preach it, because I think Christ is victorious over everything that defeats us and Christ as an example to show us how to change the world and how to actually be godly and be righteous um, is, is more powerful for me and it's more powerful for preaching. Mm-hmm. Well, that's about all the time we have. And uh, this is a discussion. You know, we, we've hit different ideas and, and theories and, you know, it's up to you and how you believe. We're not saying this is right or wrong. This is a show that... Uh, kind of sheds light on different ways of thinking about religion. We have different types of people on here. And uh, just open for your consideration and, uh, you know, your interpretation. I would never say you're wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would say interesting, maybe. but <laughs> Right. Because there's as many people as there are, there's different ways to believe. And we all have to... Uh, let each other live as Mm -hmm. they want. So thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time.